Sounds good. Great to have you along for the ride. Thanks a lot for stopping by. Really glad to have this man on. He's the Republican nominee for Vice President of the United States, of course, Senator from the great state of Ohio. It's J.D. Vance. J.D., how are you? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure to have you on. Now, I've teased this interview four times now, I think, and people have been very, very patient, and I'm truly honored to have you on. I don't have time because of time constraints to tell you all the reasons why Dan Marino's far better uh, quarter uh, quarterback and pure <laughs> passer than Joe Montana. We'll get into that next time, J.D., but you've got, we got other stuff to worry about. Um, first and foremost, are you tired? Man, every time I look at X, every time I look at television, you're sitting down somewhere, you're going, you're walking around shaking hands. This has to be grueling but but you look like you're you know worse for the wear talk to me about that well first of all it's like a nuclear bomb to drop in the conversation to say that marina is better than montana <laughs> and expect me not to respond to it <laughs> i will say i, I will say they're it's interesting i believe they're both both from western pa yes they are so there's something about like western pa i don't know if it's something in the water that just produces these epic quarterbacks right. but that's fine we can we can I can tell you all the reasons why you're wrong and, and why Joe Montana is better in the next conversation. Okay, but man, no, I, I I'm not tired at all. You know, we first of all we've only been doing this for six weeks, and you know it's it's what's crazy about being the VP nominee, of course, is you know I was one of the first senators to endorse Donald Trump, maybe the very first senator to endorse President Trump for his 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 2024 campaign. Right. So I've kind of been writing you know a little bit in the background for this ride for the last two years. If he's been running for two years, I've been running for six weeks. So if I was tired, uh, that would be a bad sign. But, man, we're so energized by the people that we meet, by the mission to take back the country. And as you can probably tell, I actually like the hostile media interviews because, yeah, they'll ask them unfair questions. And, yes, uh, they, they don't do the same to the Democrats. But, you know, my attitude is it's such an honor to be able to run for vice president. You ought to get out there and talk to whoever you can talk to, even if it's somebody that's going to ask biased questions because – yeah, they can ask biased questions, but we still get to give our answers. And uh, that's what I'm going to keep on doing. I think you should do that if you want to be the people's vice president. And I think that's ultimately the way to to win the fight is to actually get out there and make the case. Uh, it's J.D. Vance, uh, of course, the Republican nominee for vice president of the United States. Were you were you well aware? Were you ready for the media to be as as completely animosity filled as it has been? I mean, when you sit down with somebody and give them 15, 20 minutes and 13 minutes is spent on the things you've said about Trump or the things you've said about Walls or the things you've said about, you know, my mom, I mean, whatever it happens to be, they will go negative on you and try to use that entire time to show how bad a guy you are. I think you've handled it masterfully where you tell Dan Bash, are we going to talk about what, what we want to do or are we just going to talk about Walls? But were you ready for this level of it? You know, I definitely, I, I definitely did expect it because, you know, of course, the president and I, he and I have gotten very close. I mean, he's given me a lot of advice just about what's going on and how unfair the media is. Right. I mean, he told me the day that he selected me, he said, "Man, you were in for the craziest ride. You think they've come after you before? They're going to come after you like you were their worst enemy, right. and they're going to do it right away." And he was right about that. But man, it's it's just part of the game. You know, one of my my favorite. Um, old school Democrat politicians was President Harry S. Truman, who famously said, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. We have such a, a set of problems in this country. I, I kind of like, actually, that the media is so hostile to us because it reveals how afraid they are of losing their power and losing their grip over this country. And I think it drives home that, you know, President Trump is not like a go along to get along president. He's right. not a placeholder. He's actually saying the country has been broken. There are serious problems, and we have to solve those problems, not just sort of, you know, be a placeholder president. And I think that's a very, very important sign, and it's why they go after him in the way that he do, that they do. And, of course, they go after me because I'm his running mate. And uh, I think it's it's a great honor to run. It's part of the cost of doing business. But, man, if we, get, if we win, we get to take back the country, yeah. close the border, bring down the price of goods for American citizens, and just bring some common sense back to our government. That's a price I'm willing to pay. U.S. Senator J.D. Vance, we appreciate the time and the access. Let's just quickly talk about, about debates. Trump ends Biden's career in that debate in June on June 27th. I mean, 54-year career out, you kick to the curb. Then we have this debate the other night where you've got, I didn't even realize it until the day after, two days later, I don't know if you knew this, but but one of the, the so-called moderators is a sorority sister of, of Kamala Harris. Harris doesn't answer any questions whatsoever, poses the entire time. And, and the fact checks are going on against Trump, and they were all wrong, by the way. They fact checked him incorrectly, and they didn't fact check her at all, and she lied uh, by some counts 25 times. 
What do you make of the whole debate system? I, I've moderated debates in Michigan when there were gubernatorial um, uh, races going on when I was a TV news anchor there, as you know. Um, and, and my job was never to fact check anybody. My job was to ask the question, let them answer. They can fact check each other or we can do the spin room later. What, what, what is your take when you see how combative that, that debate was the other night and what they were trying to do? Well, like you, I didn't know that the moderator, one of the moderators was Kamala Harris's sorority sister, an incredible oversight from yeah. ABC, and probably not an oversight, let's be honest. Yeah. These guys, they are part of the Democratic National Committee's operation. I think it's clear in the way that they ask the questions. But, you know, it's it's funny, despite being three-on-one, if you look at some of the polls afterwards of undecided voters, they liked how President Trump did. Yeah. And I think, importantly, they recognize that, that, that Kamala Harris didn't answer the questions. And if you think about what the real Kamala Harris strategy here, it's to treat the American people like children. And the Donald Trump strategy is to treat the American people like fellow citizens. Yeah. And it's really striking how different that is, because what I'd encourage your listeners to do, I mean, if they've got, you know, five, 10 minutes, is if you read the transcript of the debate, it becomes obvious that Kamala Harris is not answering the questions at all. It's like they ask a question, she gives a slogan. They ask a question, she gives another slogan. And it's so preposterous to think that we have a president, a vice president of the United States who wants to be the president, who can't answer basic questions, right. even when she's been rehearsing them. It's nuts, man. But it drives home how bad and how incompetent of a leader she is and would be if we give her a promotion. I mean, think about this. If she can't answer questions with a friendly debate moderator, how could we possibly expect her to negotiate on our behalf with world leaders, with foreign adversaries? It's crazy we can't give this woman a promotion. It's uh, J.D. Vance. No, we can't. It's J.D. Vance. He's the Republican nominee for vice president, also senator from the great state of Ohio. Uh, as I was watching her on the campaign trail yesterday, I think in North Carolina, she was going on and on and on about how we have to turn the page. Now, in a book, the past would be pages earlier. The present would be this page we're on, and the future would be pages that we haven't read yet. She is now on the page where she's the vice president. Why She wants us to turn the page away from her being in charge, away from this administration. Was that an endorsement for you and Trump? It's a, do they, J.D., obviously I'm, I'm being facetious. She thinks that she's getting a message across that, that makes sense, but it doesn't. Are the American people listening to that and going, yeah, yeah, let's turn the page and, and hand it to the person who's in charge now? And I, I, I maybe just haven't been in politics long enough because I am not shameless enough <laughs> to stand up before the American people and say on day one that we're going to close the border or we're going to bring down the cost of housing when I've been the sitting vice president for three and a half years. Yes. I, I mean, if you think about what she's doing, she is basically pretending that her party is out of power. She's not just in power. She's the sitting vice president of the United States. Right. It's completely preposterous. So she knows that the American people don't like Biden's policies. Remember, two months ago, they were all running on the idea that Biden's economy was great, even though no American believed it, because we all see the evidence with our own eyes. Right. Now they've pivoted to a new candidate, the same old policies, but somehow they're trying to pretend that Kamala Harris has no affiliation with Joe Biden. It's kind of interesting if you think about it. If they had selected somebody else, like if Josh Shapiro was running or if somebody else was running, it might be easier for them to run away from the policies of Joe Biden. Right. They managed to select his actual vice president, and then gaslight the American people, pretending she hasn't been in the government for the last three and a half years. I just don't think the American people are going to buy it. It is uh, J.D. Vance, the Republican nominee for uh, vice president of the United States, senator from the great state of Ohio. Uh, we became aware of you on it. Well, I knew of you before this, but I think nationally people said, hey, who's this J.D. Vance guy? When you're in East Palestine and you were walking through with the train wreck to where the chemical spill was and how these people were forgotten because they were Trump voters, generally speaking, and they were not Biden voters. So, I mean, Biden flew over East Palestine. I can't uh, count the number of times. Never bothered to stop and, and even shake a hand or give a smile or roll his sleeves up. You're walking through the water that you knew was not potable. You were walking through an area that you knew wasn't livable. Um, you already were a guy from Appalachia. We, you already were a guy that, that grew up in, in a different way than the elites like Kamala Harris and so on. But what did that bring you as far as knowledge of the people and, and their politics not mattering, their needs and their wants and, and their ability to live freely and enjoy life in America? What did that experience with you wading through that water do for you? You know, there, there's sort of a two-step I realize that happens in our politics where not only are a lot of Americans ignored by their leaders, but they're told to shut up when they complain. Yeah. And so 
one hand, we're going to enact policies that screw up your life, that drive up the cost of goods, that open the border, that you know l- literally lead to a train disaster in your town, a chemical spill in your town. But if you complain about it, we're going to tell you you're stupid. We're going to tell you you're racist. We're going to tell you, well, drink the water. It's all fine, even though the evidence of your eyes is, well, if the fish are dead in the creek, then I'm not going to drink the water, um, even if it goes through a couple of layers of filtration. Yeah. And I, I, it just sort of made me realize that so much of what's going on in this country, the American people, not, not only are they dissatisfied with it, but they're told to shut up about it. And what a, a complete inversion of our constitutional system where I think our founding fathers expected our leaders would be kind of afraid of their citizens or at least see them as fellow citizens that they had to answer to, where in 2024, so much of our country, so much of our, of our leadership sees their citizens as subjects and not as fellow citizens. Don't complain about this or you're a bad person. Don't vote for Trump uh, or you're a racist. Don't vote for a change or you know you don't understand economics. There's just a lot of preaching and a lot of people who are in charge telling the American public they know what's best, and if you disagree with them, you're stupid. And that's what I love about President Trump is he's just totally different, right? He actually thinks that you should have to go and earn the people's vote. Yeah. He actually thinks that if they, you know, they disagree with you, you should maybe try to persuade them and not lie to them. And it's just a fundamental different approach to government that I think is much more consistent with the idea of citizenship that our founding fathers created. Yeah, because he doesn't want to be a monarch. He wants to be somebody who actually is working for the people. This guy could sit at home, you know, uh, on his on his gold toilet and ride around in a golf cart. Instead, he's doing this after being shot in the head. So it's all very interesting. J.D. Vance is the Republican nominee for vice president. Let's talk about some news happening today. In Ohio, there's reports about Haitians and geese and all that. We know that non-emergency lines have been released, and we know that people are saying this is happening with the, the, the geese in the city and so on. But instead of being diverted by all of that, I think that you said, something that's so pertinent. The 15 to 20,000 Haitians that have been shipped there by Joe Biden have changed that city and that area of Ohio massively. And and in, in doing so, there's such a strain on the services there and the money that should be going to the residents. The, the residents are paying the money and they're, they're getting no benefit of the services. In fact, the city is going broke. That's really the story, isn't it, J.D., that where you've got massive amounts of people from foreign nations that came here illegally getting on the government dole, it's harming cities. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it's harming cities. It's stretching municipal budgets. You've got schools where they have hundreds of children now who don't speak English. This is a small Ohio town, right? right? It is not easy for a small school district to just respond to hundreds of children who don't speak the language. So, of course, the local kids get less good of an education. The municipal budget is stretched. The people who are paying taxes get screwed. And to your point, they don't get services out of it. But if you look at all of the ways in which this influx of migration has affected Springfield, Ohio, man, it drives home just how much the promises. People say that mass illegal immigration uh, is the path to prosperity. Springfield shows how much that's a lie. Yes. Because here's what's going on in Springfield. You have a rise in communicable diseases. No one disputes that. You have a rise in insurance rates because car insurance rates, uh, because a lot of these migrants are getting in car accidents, which jacks up the car insurance premiums of every person there. And and of course, makes their streets less safe to live on. Uh, Nobody disputes that you have an increase in crime. Nobody disputes that. The biggest thing I hear from residents is housing costs have gone through the roof because a lot of government benefits are going to house Haitians. So the landlords are kicking out the citizens who live there, replacing them with people who are paying more thanks to government benefits. Sick. No one disputes this is happening. Now, at the same time, to be clear, we've heard from a number of residents who say that, for example, the migrants are eating geese in the park, and the media is going wild over this while completely ignoring yes. the actual complaints of residents on the ground. So look, my job as a United States senator is not to bow down before the media mob. If residents are telling me their lives are getting worse, we have to take it seriously. And again, this is what Kamala Harris's open border does, is it floods massive amounts of migrants into these communities. She has explicitly pursued policies that give amnesty to over 100,000 Haitian migrants in just the last couple of years. You cannot do that and then try to pretend that this is not a major problem. 
It's not just similar to the, from what's happening in Aurora, Colorado, where you've got Governor Polis, who is basically Baghdad Bob, saying it's not happening as we're watching it happen on video. Um, something has to be done. Two last questions. I know you've got to go and you've given me a lot of time already, J.D. The first one has to be, what do you do about the border yesterday? I'm here in Texas. We see it happening. Texas has done a good job in lowering the numbers. Biden and Harris are trying to take credit for what Texas did. They can't. They broke the border. What do you do day one? And, and along with that, everybody that I talk with about immigration they ask a simple question. How do you get rid of 10 to 21 million people who are here illegally? Mass deportation sounds good. How do you do it? Well, first of all, you got to stop the bleeding, right? You, you, know, you, you lose your leg, you stop the bleeding, yeah. then you figure out how to, how to, how to fix it from there. The, the stop the bleeding approach is re-implement the Remain in Mexico policy, stop the catch and release, stop the asylum fraud, and start to re-implement deportations just if for nothing else to send a signal that you come, can't come here illegally, enjoy welfare benefits, and hang out in this country for 10 to 15 years or more. That's yes. what you have to do on day one. Now, from there, look, I, I, I think that you have to mobilize our law enforcement resources, local and federal, to deport people who shouldn't be in this country to begin with. And I think you start with it. You, know, you take a piecemeal approach here. You start with the worst offenders. You start with the violent criminals, the people who not just broke our laws to get in here, but also committed violent crimes on the other end. That's one to two million people, right? That's a lot of people. And you start there. And then you work your way down the list from there. But look, if, if the signal that we're sending is you come to this country illegally, Kamala Harris tries to grant you amnesty, and then you can't ever deport people, then you're fundamentally sending a signal that if one administration opens the border, it can never be closed again. We can't tolerate that. And if you look at polling, a large majority of Republicans, independents, and even Democrats support deporting people who came here illegally. We just have to do it and empower law enforcement. I know you got to go. It's J.D. Vance. One last question. We just saw the DOJ numbers come out yesterday. Violent crime is up massively in this country. Kamala Harris and Joe Biden have been lying about that for four straight years now, that somehow crime was higher under, under Trump and they lessened crime. How do we use this now to make sure that the American people get the true story as the media will not try to hide this? Again, violent crime up, I think it's 40%. Yeah, that's right. Depending on what crime we're talking about, 30 to 60% yeah. of some violent crimes. And look, uh, the Department of Justice has, has, I think, the leadership has been complicit in trying to tell the story that somehow violent crime has come down. What ha actually happened is that violent crime skyrocketed in 2021 and 2022, of course, after the summer riots of 2020. Yes. So you have police who are under assault. You have American citizens who don't enjoy safety in their communities. And then they started to fudge the statistics in an effort to say that crime was actually coming down, when in reality, we, we know that crime is way higher than it was when Donald Trump was president. Yes. So, look, we just have to tell the American people, man, this is not rocket science. You just empower law enforcement to arrest the bad guys. If you look at any city, the gross majority of violent crime is committed by a very small number of people. If you want to drive down violent crime, arrest the bad guys, throw them in prison, and empower law enforcement to do their job, if you do that, you solve a big chunk of the problem. It is uh, J.D. Vance, the Republican nominee for vice president. J.D., thanks for making time today on your very, very busy schedule. Let's do it again soon, my friend. Thank you. Thanks, man. Take care. All right, brother. We're back after this. Stay right here.